cannot get a Christian through adultery, through fornication. If the devil cannot get a Christian to fall and to yield to temptation through stealing, if the devil cannot get a Christian to drink and to smoke, if the devil cannot get a Christian through, uh, you know, walking through 419, he'll get them by murmuring. He'll get them by complaining. He'll get them by grumbling. They'll murmur against God, against the Word of God, against the people of God, against the leadership in the church, against their husbands, against their wives, against uh, sectional leaders in the church. They'll find something to murmur about. When the devil is behind somebody and is pushing him and pushing him and pushing him, you will not steal, you will not commit adultery, you will not smoke, you will not drink, and you will not fight. Uh -huh. I'll get you to follow all the same. And many people, when they murmur like that, they don't know they're yielding to the temptation of the devil. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and they were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all these things happen unto them. For examples, and they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. Let the people that are overconfident, let them take heed. Let the people that say, I can never fall, I know myself, I'm strong, I'm mighty, I'm powerful, take heed, lest you fall. Let him that thinketh and standeth, take heed, lest they fall. And he's talking about temptation. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my beloved, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. You don't say, well, idolatry early and be beyond that now. I've grown beyond that. I can overcome that any day. I'm stronger than that. Flee and run away from idol worship. In James chapter 4, James chapter 4, I'm reading from verses 6 and 7. We're looking at the source of victory for the Christian. The Christian that wants to keep on standing. And the Christian that wants to remain victorious until Christ comes. The source of that Christian's victory over over temptation, James chapter 4, verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. The people that say, Lord, I am not strong by myself. The people that say, without Christ, I can do nothing, I am nothing. The people that say, I'm not overconfident, I'm not even confident at all in myself. What do I know? What do I have? What can I do? You must help me. He giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The assurance we're given is, if we will resist the devil in the strength of the Lord, in the power of the Lord, by the anointing of the Spirit of God and by the conviction the courage, the boldness the Lord has given us. He says if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. In First Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And then he says, be sober, don't be frivolous, don't be careless, don't let the devil catch you be frivolous. Don't let the devil catch you belittling the word of God, belittling the spiritual things. Don't let the devil catch you being unserious and careless and carefree. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, and the devil who wants to catch the Christian is not frivolous. It's watchful. It's looking at you for your careless moment. It's not carefree. 
is very serious and it means business. And if you don't mean business, you really stand firm in the Lord. Knowing there is a crown waiting for you. Knowing that Christ is coming. And you need to endure to the end if you are going to be saved. If you are not as serious as the devil. And the devil is so serious running out of you. Wanting to make you fall. If you forget yourself. If you are carefree. And if you are free for laws, he will catch you. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Resist him persistently. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplishing your brethren that are in the world. And then you need the word of God. We're told in Psalm 119. Psalm 1. One nine in Psalm one hundred and nineteen, reading from verse nine. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Are we going to remain clean, remain righteous, remain pure, remain victorious, remain more than a conqueror by taking heed according to thy word? A real Christian who understands that it's important to have victory over temptation will not play for the word of God. He'll read that word. He will study that word. And you'll underline salient, important passages that strike you in the word of God. You will eat of that bread of life, of that word of God. You will sharpen the sword of the spirit, the word of God in your life. If you want to have the victory, because that's how you can cleanse your way. That's how you can remain clean, remain victorious. By taking heed according to thy word, with my whole heart, have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I heed in my heart. Thy word have I heed in my heart. Don't hide other things in your heart. You understand? If you fill your box with useless, worthless, unimportant things, there will be no space for real things of importance in that box anymore. And if you fill the bucket with something worthless, useless, unimportant, you will not have space in that bucket for something that is very useful and very necessary. When you fill your heart with unnecessary things, things of this life and the cares of this life, there will be no space in that place for the word of God. And it is the word of God that gives you the victory every time. Your word, have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's how to have the victory. Of course, you must be a man of decision, a man of determination, a man of passion, a man of purpose, that you are not going to sin, you are not going to yield to the devil in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. You need that purpose because that meat will come, the dainty meat of Babylon, and the desires of the people of the world, and the pressures and the pleasures of the people of the world. Of course it will come, but you make a purpose in your heart, determination, decision within you. You will not defile yourself, except that purpose of heart is there, you will be defiled, because the thing will be so attractive, and the thing will be so inviting, and the thing will be so pleasing to the flesh, and then it will be so popular. Many other people are doing it, why don't you? Many other people are yielding, why don't you you yield. You must have a purpose in your heart if you are going to overcome the devil. In First Timothy chapter 6, First Timothy chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 9. And here the word of God is reminding us, they that will be rich fall into temptation and it's near. The people who want money at all costs, they must have it. They must be rich. Quick, quick, even as teenagers, even as young people, we must have the money now. Education, not important. Training, not important. And having wisdom in life, that's not important. We need money, 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 money now. And the men and the women that are just committed to looking for money, 
if they go anywhere, if they come to church, if they read the Bible, all they're looking for is promises and money. And they're not thinking of holiness, righteousness, sanctification, everything is money. You're going to fall into temptation because the money will so blindfold you, you will not know how to escape temptation. It says, but for the love of, but they that will be rich fall into temptation is near. And it will many foolish and not for lost, which draw men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Even in the church, if there is a love of money, it will be the root of all evil. You are told to go and buy something for the church. And you will be looking for you are going to cheat the church. Because the love of money is there. And you are backsliding long, long ago without recovering yourself. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which was some coveted after. They have erred from their faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, man of God, child of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called. And as profess a good profession before many witnesses. And we're told in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Reading from verses 40 and 41. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 40, and he comments unto, comments unto his disciples and findeth them asleep. And says unto Peter, what? Could ye not watch with me an hour, one hour, watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We need to keep on praying, because it is a prayer that will shield you, that will strengthen you, that will help you and support you to overcome temptation in First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, reading from verse 12. First John chapter 2, verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I have written unto you, I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. If we're going to be strong to the point to overcome the wicked one, it's as a result of the word of God abiding in us. Once again, let me ask you, what's the source of the Christian's victory over temptation? Number one, the presence of Christ within. I'll never leave you. I'll be with you. So, when the devil comes, realize, be conscious of the presence of Christ within. Number two, the power of the Spirit. The Spirit that dwelt, that raised up Jesus from the dead. It dwells in your mortal body. And because it dwells in you and remains in you, you'll be victorious. Number three, persevering in purity to endure to the end. Every time temptation comes, you understand, you are pure yesterday. But you must continue persevering in purity so that you will endure unto the very end. Number four, prevailing prayer of faith. Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. Prevailing prayer of faith. Number five, persistent resistance of temptation. Persistent resistance of temptation. Oh, the devil will still come. You keep on persisting. You keep on resisting. I said no before Satan. I'm still saying no. And the devil said, why don't you do this? You've been, you know, waiting for marrying somebody and you've tried and tried and there is no believer to get married to. Why don't you go and marry an unbeliever? That's a great temptation. And you say, Satan, I said no two years ago. I said no last year. I'm still saying no today. 
My mother suggested it. I said no. And my auntie suggested it. I said no. And some backsliders who have done it and they have lost their victory, they have lost the glory of God in their lives. Some backsliders suggested to me, I said no. And you are saying it, I am still saying no. That's how to overcome the devil. Persistent resistance of temptation. Then number six, you have the purpose of living. You're seeking for God's glory. You have a purpose in your heart. You have a purpose in your mind. And you're focused on the Lord. You say, that's all I'm living for. That's all I'm living for. The purpose for living. Then number seven, possession of God's grace. You're seeking the grace of God. And you have the grace of God. You possess the grace of God. And the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. Possession of God's grace. Number eight is passion and vision for heaven. You want to get to heaven. You know there is heaven. You know Jesus has got to prepare a place for you. And you know if you are going to be in heaven, everyone that has their soap in him purifies himself, even as he is pure, because of that passion and vision for heaven. That's why you will not yield to temptation. Number nine, proclamation and pursuit of Christ's victory. You are proclaiming the victory of Christ. And you are saying, because he triumphed, I will, I will triumph to you. Because you overcame, I will overcome to you. You are proclaiming and you are pursuing the victory of Christ. Number ten, the promise of divine support and help. The promise of divine support and help. You are relying upon the promise of God. And it says, I will support you. You will not fall. I will keep you. I will hold you in my hand. I will not allow you to fall. And you are depending upon that promise of divine support and divine help. I come to point number three. The strength of conquerors and victors over the tempter. The strength of conquerors and victors over the tempter. In Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, he is able to sustain, he is able to support, he is able to hold up them that are tempted. Because Christ has overcome. In all his temptations, he was a victor. Because you overcame, you too you can overcome. That's why you go to the Lord in prayer. That's why you are serious and you are telling the Lord, Lord, help me, sustain me, support me, and hold me up, hold my hand so that I will not fall. Hebrews chapter 4 from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4 from verse 14. See then that we have a great high priest. That is passed into the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest that cannot be touched or the feeling of our infirmities. But he was in all points tempted like us we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's come boldly to the throne of grace. That, that's the reason when, after you've had the word of God, and you come to pray, you pray with all your heart, with all your soul. Because you don't want to appear like... Um, you know, mocking God. and You don't want to appear like little children. I mean, real, real infants who do not know the essence of prayer. And they do not know the reason for prayer. And they do not know the power we derive in prayer. They do not know the need we have of prayer. And therefore, when their parents tell them to pray, you know what they do at home, those little, little infants? But those of us, teenagers, those of us, men and women that know God, that, that know that we need strength from the Lord, we come to the throne of grace because we need help. Temptation will come today. Temptation will come during the week. Temptation will come in our lives. We need the strength of the Lord. We need the grace of the Lord. Therefore, we come with all seriousness. And we come with all heavy heart. And with a, a disposition that is telling the Lord, I cannot bear this load alone. I cannot overcome this temptation alone. I cannot live this life alone. Help me. That's how the Lord will help. Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah chapter 40, 
reading from verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. If your temptations are so much, and your temptations are almost overwhelming you, and you're almost fainting, almost falling, almost yielding, almost succumbing and surrendering to the devil, he giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. You know, the youths and the young men that are thinking, oh, we're strong. There's nothing, oh, all those people bring in the temptation. Are they not uh, teenagers like myself, young people like myself? I can overcome. They are surprised when the temptations eventually come and they fall. And that's why the encouragement is coming to boys, girls, teenagers, adults, men, women, all believers. Wait on the Lord. Verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I pray the Lord will give us the spirit of supplication. The spirit of prayer. And we will overcome in Jesus' name. In Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Reading from verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage. You are going to overcome the devil. Be strong and of a good courage. Don't let the devil see fearfulness, timidity, and trembling and shaking in you. If the devil sees that you are afraid of him, you are afraid of evil spirits, and you are afraid of witches and wizards, and you are afraid of, uh, you know, girls and women and tempters and temptresses, if the devil sees that you are not sure of the grace of God in you, you are not sure of the strength and the might of the spirit of the living God, and you are always quaking, always trembling, always, you know, timid, and the devil is going to take advantage of that. Be strong. And of a good courage. For unto these people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land, which as swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from each to the right hand or to the left. Be committed to the word of God. Don't turn to the left. Don't turn to the right. Don't look for any easy way. Just stay with the word of God, abide with the word of God every time. And then it says that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Don't meditate on what the worldly people are saying. What the backsliders are teaching, what the backsliders are suggesting. Don't meditate on what the tempters are saying. Meditate on the word of God. The book of the law of God shall not depart from your mouth. You'll meditate on it day and night. Why? So that you'll be able, you'll be, you'll observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shall thou make thy way prosperous, and then shall thou have Good success in um, Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. I read from verse 1, verse 2, and then verse 11. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 1. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. The word of God has your strength. The armor of the Lord has your strength. Put on your strength people of God. And then it says your beautiful garment, the garment of salvation and the garments of praise. Put on your beautiful garments of Jerusalem. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Have you fallen already? Rise up. As the devil put your nose, your mouth to the ground to lick the doors, shake yourself from the doors and say, My enemy rejoice not against me. When I fall, I shall rise again. I see maybe a backslider. 
and now you are in the far country, and you are in the midst of swines and souls and pigs, trying to eat what the people of the world are eating, and drinking what the people of the world are drinking. Arise, and shake yourself from the doors, and see thou Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. If the devil has put a single rope around your neck, and you are still sitting down there, it's going to make another turn, another round, another chain. If the devil has defeated you and you are lying down there, it's going to bring a heavy chain and tie you down there until the day of resurrection, until the day of the rapture, tie you down there that will not allow you to rise. And before he does that and manifests greater power in your life to keep you down, rise up. And say, no, I will not remain a backslider. I'm going to serve the Lord. Temptations no more. Sin no more. Yielding to the devil no more. I'm going to be cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Shake yourself from the doors. Arise and sit down. And loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. And in verse 11, depart ye, depart ye. Come out of that place. And the prostitutes are ganging up around you. And the, gang, the, the gangs of robbers are trying to make you to be in their company. Come out of there and touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her and be clean. Ye that bear the vessels of the Lord and say you will have the victory and you will have the victory in Jesus name. The Lord is calling you today if you are backsliding. You have yielded to temptation and the Lord is saying you can repent and you can turn to the Lord. You can shake yourself from the doors. You can arise. And all those evil things that you have gone into, you, you can turn away from them. All the gangs you have, you have, you have joined. All the society you have joined. All the people, unserious people, devilish people, backsliding people, sinful people. And the people that are not going to heaven. And they are inviting, and you have joined them. It says, come out from the midst of them. And be separate, says the Lord. And then I will receive you. I will take you unto myself. I'll be your father. You'll be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And as you come, and the Lord forgives you. Don't just stay there. Keep on moving on. And have greater Christian experiences in your life. When you are saved, don't stay there. Get sanctified. When you are sanctified, don't stay there. Get filled with the Holy Ghost. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, don't stay there. Be involved in the service of the Lord and be winning souls. And yield yourself fully to the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. You can't be weak in the Lord. If you are in the Lord, you'll not be weak. If you are in the Lord, you'll not be timid. If you are in the Lord, you'll not be fearful. If you are in the Lord, you'll not be shaking for the devil. If you are in the Lord, you'll be strong in the Lord. If you are in the Lord already, come on and come nearer to the Lord. Come closer to the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. I don't just say, well, I put on this one, I put on that one. That's enough. No, it's not enough. It's not enough. Keep on moving on. Keep on moving on. And it says, you'll put on the whole arm of God. That he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Thank God we can stand. I said, thank God we can stand. When the devil comes like a running lion. When he comes like a mighty flood. And he wants to overwhelm you. You have the faith in God. You have the understanding in God. You have the conviction in God. We, the people of God, we can stand. And we will stand in Jesus' name. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities and against powers. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. The day of temptation, that's the evil day. The day when the devil is soliciting that you fall into temptation, that you go back to your vomit and take up your vomit again, that's the evil day. But when you rise now and when you shake yourself from the doors and you call upon the name of the Lord and now you put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand and withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. I mean, your loins got about what truth. I mean, on the breastplate of righteousness. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all.
beyond all, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench. How many that's of the devil? How many? Ah, we cannot victory, no matter from what direction the devil is coming. No matter the darts, the fairy darts, and the arrows that the devil might be throwing. No matter the in always. Praying always, serious prayer. Praying always, fervent prayer. Praying always, heartfelt prayer. Praying always, sincere prayer. Praying always, prayer of faith. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching there unto you. And with all perseverance and supplication with all saints. That's all we're going to have. The victory, you will not allow the devil to touch you. And he will not touch you. You will not allow the devil to bring you down. He will not bring you down. In First John chapter 5 verse 18. First John chapter 5 verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. When you are born of God, the grace is there not to sin. The power is there not to sin. The virtue of Christ is there not to sin. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. You will keep yourself. You cannot be running around with backsliders and think you are going to stay. You are going to stand firm. You cannot be running around with hypocrites and think that you are going to go free. You cannot be running around with people that do not take the word of God serious and think that you are going to get to heaven. He keepeth himself and that wicked one touches him not. And then in verse 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. You will keep yourselves. That's how the Lord is going to keep you. You you show the seriousness that you actually want to stand. You want to be kept in the Lord and kept in the faith. That's how you stand. In Jude, reading from verse 20. Jude, verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves. Boys, keep yourselves. Girls, keep yourselves. Fathers and mothers, keep yourselves. If you are born again, if you are a child of God, and you have the desire to get to heaven, keep yourselves. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our God of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference in your evangelism. You're going out, you're evangelizing. That's all right. Have compassion on them. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. There are some sinners that already they are the brink of hell. And some of those sinners do not care whether they go to hell or don't go to hell. And they want to pull. Now even the believers that are trying to evangelize them, be wise. I'm a wise, a serpent, and gentle, harmless as doves. It says, so that save what fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling, God is able. I said, God is able. Whatever temptations may face your life, and whatever challenges you may face, whatever trials may be there, unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And everybody said, Amen. The Lord will keep you. The Lord understands what you are going through. He has enough grace for you. Grace for salvation. Grace for sanctification. Grace for your trials. And grace for every need of your life. Let's now go boldly before the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find help in the time of need. I pray that all of us who have heard this word today, the salvation of the Lord will not miss us in Jesus' name. And then the strength of the Lord to stand firm and stand faithful and stand true unto the end. The Lord will make us stand in Jesus' name. Pray to the Lord before you go. And tell the Lord, O Lord, here am I. I want to be an overcomer. 
I want to overcome temptation every time. I know the grace is there. I know the promise is there. I know the power is there. I know the preservation is there. I know the strength of the Lord is there. And I know that you have promised to keep me. And you will keep me. And I want to be kept. And I know your presence will go with me. He is Emmanuel. God with us. He will be with you. If you are not born again, give your life to the Lord and be born again. If you are not a child of God yet, why don't you repent of your sin? Turn away from your sin and say, Lord, here I come. I am a sinner. I know that Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. I believe, I believe, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the Lord will save you. And if you have been saved, you need the strength of the Lord. And you need purpose of heart, purpose of heart. That you are focused on the glory of God alone. You, are, you need that purpose of heart so that the Lord himself will know that you really want the Lord. And you desire the Lord. Pray. If you have been saved, that the Lord will give you the victory over sin. Victory over temptation. A victory over your trials. And if you have not been sanctified, why don't you get sanctified? Because you see, that Adamic nature within can be an attraction for the devil. A magnet for the devil. That the devil will be coming and that Adamic nature will not allow you to remain stable and steadfast in the Lord. Why don't you say, Lord, sanctify me. You desire sanctification. You consecrate for sanctification. And you pray for sanctification. And you believe the Lord for sanctification. He says, I'll take the stony heart out of their flesh. I will give them the heart of flesh. Let him do it. Let him do it. Let him take away that Adamic nature. Let him take away that root of sin. Let him take away that propensity to evil. Propensity and tendency to murmuring, to grumbling, to complaining. Let him take everything away. And say, Lord, wash me, cleanse me with the blood of the Lamb. Cleanse me, wash me with the blood of the Lamb. Help me to be stable. Help me to be steadfast. I want to serve the Lord. In all sincerity, I want to serve the Lord. Wholeheartedly, I want to serve the Lord. I don't want to be falling and rising, falling and rising, falling and rising. I want to be steadfast and stable in the Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. I cannot overcome by myself alone. I cannot overcome by myself alone. Without me, ye can do nothing. But with Christ, with Christ, with Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do, I can do, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He will strengthen you. You'll overcome. Put on the strength of God. Put on the armor of God. Put on all the armor of God. That you may be able to stand and withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. Don't let the devil get you. Don't let the temptation pull you down. And don't let all these things that are uh, dangling before you in the world. Don't let them overwhelm you. You can stand. You can stand. You will stand in the strength of the Lord and the might of the Lord. And remember, whosoever shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. If you yield to temptation and you fall and you don't endure to the end, if Jesus comes and meets you in that falling condition, you'll miss heaven forever. You'll spend eternity in hell. That's why it's important for you to rise now. Arise and shine. Shake off yourself from the dust. And be free from all those evil things that want to overwhelm your life. Put on the strength of the Lord. And don't go back into those evil things anymore. And the Lord will keep you true and keep you faithful, keep you standing, keep you victorious and triumphant until the very end. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we come before you tonight. We praise your name because of what you have done for us. 
individually and collectively as a church. We pray that as we see the closing chapter, which we've been studying for a long time, concerning Stephen, we pray that you will make us to see the grace and the truth and the influence and the impact, the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon this man again, so that we ourselves will be able to have more of your power and presence in our lives at all times, in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We have spent quite some time studying the life and the ministry of Stephen. And we have spent quite a long time looking at the grace and the gifts of God in the life of this wonderful man. And as we have got a glimpse of what the power of God has done in his life, we cannot but just look up to God and say, what you have done in the life of this individual, do within us as well. And today we come to the end of chapter 7, which apparently is also the end of the life of Stephen. And he started his life, the time we've known him in the scriptures, in such a glorious way. And the end was glorious as well. And we have seen how God, in his power, by his presence, can be with his own children, and it could be our best for him in all situations. As we come to the close of Stephen's earthly life and ministry, I want you to see some contrasts in the chapter that we read now, the end of the chapter. We'll just quickly go through the end of the chapter because there is so much in this end of the chapter. And perhaps many preachers do not think of the much we have in the few verses that end up the life of this man and the chapter before us. I want you to see some contrasts there. The contrast between a spirit-filled man and a Satan-inspired mob. The contrast between the righteous and the religious. The contrast between a far-sighted visionary saint of God and a short-sighted vicious sinner. The contrast between love and hate. You see that in the closing part of this chapter. And many casual readers, they see Stephen as a victim as the chapter closes and his life ends. But no, you don't see Stephen as a victim, he's a victor. And he was even more than a conqueror. I want to remind you that the members of the Sanhedrin or the council had called him for questioning. They had accused him of four things. Number one, blasphemy against God. Number two, blasphemy against Moses. Number three, blasphemy against the law. And number four, blasphemy against the temple. These, I told you before, are great issues. They were great issues in the lives, in the policy, the religion of the children of Israel at the time. And they, they leveled this four-count charge against him, against God, Moses, the law, and the temple. And they wanted him as an accused, as a criminal, as a lawbreaker, as a blasphemer to come before them and give them answers to the questions they were asking. And it's fantastic. It's just marvelous how this man stood before them without any fear of the consequence of the actions they were taking, without any fear as to what their response will be. And very systematically, line upon line, precept upon precept, he went through the scriptures and he told them his faith, his confidence in God. And at the end of the whole thing, he showed them that he was a firm believer in God. He was a believer, not a blasphemer. And concerning Moses, he told them that he had received the ministry that God gave to Moses with a good spirit. That God chose Moses for a ministry, for a time, for a dispensation, for a period of time. And at that time, it was a necessary thing that Moses came to do. He told them that concerning the law, 
the law had been given and the law had a time, a period, a dispensation. And for what the law was supposed to do, it was all right at the time it was given and for the purpose it was given. Concerning the temple, he told them he believed in the temple. Only that they could not restrict the Almighty inside the confines of a small temple. Now, do you know that by the time he finished, he had told them that he was not the person they should accuse. If they wanted to find anybody that did not have faith in God, confidence in God, they were the people. If they wanted to find anybody that rejected Moses and rejected the greatest prophecy that came from the mouth of Moses concerning the Messiah, they were the people. And concerning the law, he told them the children of Israel had never obeyed the laws of God. And concerning the temple, he told them they were just misusing the temple. As they must remember that there was even a time Jesus made his scourge and he drove them out because they were making his father's house a den of thieves and robbers. And do you know that by the time he finished, he was no more talking like an accused, a criminal. He was talking like a witness, a true witness to the greatness and the glory of God, to the goodness and the kindness of God. And he was talking as a preacher, a preacher of divine truth, a preacher of the gospel, a preacher exalting Jesus Christ the Lord. And you know, he talked as a judge. They were sitting wanting to judge him, but then he gave a witness. The false witnesses were rising up, but he rose up and he was a true ambassador, a true witness. And the people who were making themselves to be the proclaimers of the truth in the nation, they were sitting down and they listened to this man as he was preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, going from one part of scripture to the other. And as these people were sitting down to judge Stephen, Stephen just stood firm and he became a judge to them. He addressed them as a witness, as a preacher, as a judge. As I come to the end of this chapter 7, I see a number of things, opposites, in the end of the chapter. On the part of the children of Israel, on the part of the members of the council, on the part of the people rejecting and resisting the truth, I see hate, cruelty, pride, a tragedy that they were in terrible darkness and confusion. And I saw the, the vengeance and the fanaticism of their lives. But on the side of, of Stephen, our man, the man of God, upon whom the Spirit of God was abiding, you see holiness, compassion, praying, triumph, calmness, vision, and forgiveness. And so then you can see, you put the sinners on the one side and the saints of God on the other side. You put these uh, people, the mob on one side and the minister of the gospel on the other side. What do you see when you look at the left and you look at the right? You see hate confronted with holiness. You see cruelty. But he responded to that cruelty with just compassion. You see their pride in their religion, but you see the praying of a righteous man. You see the tragedy on their side. You see the triumph of a man who knows the grace and the power of God. You see their confusion, but you see his calmness. You see their vision, and you hear about his vision. You see their fanaticism, and he talks about his own forgiveness for them. Above all, and beyond all, you see grace and truth overcoming all evil. Now, as we look into the closing part of the chapter, come to chapter 7, reading from verse 54. Chapter 7 from verse 54. When they had heard these things, they were caught to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young at a young man's feet whose name was Saul and they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying Lord Jesus 
received my spirit, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was consenting unto his death. In this chapter for us to really understand, we're divided into four subheadings. Conviction, consequences, cruelty, compassion. We want to see the conviction for sin. The consequences of spirit in feeling, the cruelty of the Sanhedrin, and the compassion of Stephen. Concerning the conviction for sin, anywhere the true gospel is preached, anywhere the word of God is spoken, anywhere the spirit of God is leading a preacher to proclaim the good news, the glad tidings, the covenant message, and to proclaim the mystery of the kingdom, you'll find out something. The hearers will be convicted of their sins. Now, conviction does not mean conversion. Conviction does not mean repentance. Conviction does not mean salvation. It just means the Holy Spirit applying the truth, applying the word of God so much to the hearts of the people that are hearing. They are touched. They are preached. They are caught to the heart. They are convicted. They are made insecure. And they are made to tremble because of the weight and the load of their sins. After that conviction, after the touching and the cutting of their hearts, after the pricking of their conscience, they may repent and be converted. They may rebel and be condemned. Now, in the case before us, they rebelled and they were condemned. But in other cases in the Bible, we see that the people,